Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just before we plunge in, I want to call your attention to uh, this little chart I've put on the blackboard. In preparation for our final class on Saturday, where we have to make comparative objective judgments on all these different plays, I found it very helpful to capture the entire course and content of, the, of all seven plays on two pieces of paper. And I put one exactly in the form I use on the board uh, so that you can see how for the crow epistemology to condense all the key points that you need. And then uh, you just have to run your eyes down. It for, uh, I put the main characters in capital letters, the ones that might conceivably qualify for the questions asked the strongest heroine, the uh, most admirable hero, the worst villain, etc. I put in parentheses any minor characters that might conceivably qualify, like uh, who would you most like to talk philosophy with or whichever, so that I know that this is all that Antigone has to offer as far as this assignment is concerned. And therefore, I don't have to reread the whole title of the characters page uh, 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 before I remember Antigone and then read them all from seven plays and then I'm completely lost. I, I condense down to that. Then I put the plot theme exactly as I dictated. That's the only one I don't synopsize because there every word is crucial and it must be a full sentence. Then I put climax and in some a brief way to capture what it is. Antigone is unyielding in this case. It's not a very pronounced climax. In some cases it's a, re, it's a full event like Posa is... Uh, murder or whatever. Then I put theme, and that, uh, since I know that very well, it's just philosophy, I condensed that heavily. In div, I N D I V slash state, and that tells me the individual above this state. Or, moral above political, just anything to capture in your mind what it's talking about. And then I put the final philosophy, big abstraction summarized briefly, and in this case I would put for Antigone, religion slash humanism, with the idea that he's got one foot in the religious camp and one foot in life on earth, and a little plus beside religion to indicate that it's definitely prominent, it's not vestigial. That's it. That is the total play of Antigone as far as needed for this assignment. Now you can easily get seven of these on two pages of paper. If you do that with each play, and you see, that's just a condensation of the notes, basically, that you, you should theoretically have been taking. So when you get to any of these questions, with which play do you most strongly agree? You don't have to sit back and say, oh my God, now Antigone said this, and Othello said this. You just zip through, individual above the state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it comes right out uh, at you. Or which has the most gripping climax, and you try to remember which climax was whose, whereas here you just zip through the climaxes. So I recommend that very strongly to facilitate your judgment in Lecture 8. All right, let us begin today with An Enemy of the People by Henrik Ibsen. Now this is the first modern play in this course, the only one set in the modern era, because both Shaw and Maeterlinck, though modern plays, are set in historical eras. And on top of that, it, I don't think I'm going to spoil too much by telling you that its philosophy is essentially unimpeachable across the board. Therefore, this is without doubt the easiest of the seven plays. There's no difficult language to get used to, no period to worry about, no continuous contradictions on the part of the author that baffle you. Now, this doesn't make it necessarily the best play, but it does not make it necessarily not the best play. I'm not foreclosing that question. It definitely makes it the easiest play for us. In a thousand years, it won't be that easy. But right now, this is just like, like eating uh, ice cream, so you should be able to just sit back and have pure pleasure out of this play. It, it in no way upsets, baffles, or antagonizes you, and I thought you should have that experience of one utterly unobstructed but still great play. Ibsen was uh, 1828 to 1906, Norwegian, 
author of a lot of poetry and of 26 plays, including some very famous verse plays, such as Brand, B-R-A-N-D was one of his famous ones, and Pierre Gint. But his most famous works are his final 12 prose plays, which are generally regarded as a single cycle, having a special unity among those 12. And there are people who will not study any one of those 12 without doing the whole works. However, I'm not taking that view. No, Enemy of the People is number four of his final cycle. It was written in 1882 when Ibsen was 54, and that makes it just exactly 111 years old. In the United States, Ibsen is most famous for his play, The Doll's House. And it's, that's been the big play here because it's allegedly a feminist play, which it is not, but that's what they take it as. And he has a much greater importance in the history of the theater. Can you remember in which work of hers a fiction work? Ayn Rand came out with a big plug for Ibsen in The Fountainhead when uh, Ike the genius was showing his manuscript and Tui tried to explain to him that there's no room in the theater for him and Ibsen both. And uh, that if Ike was to be enshrined in the theater, Ibsen was the one that had to be destroyed. Now that is pretty clear evidence that Miss Rand was a great admirer of Ibsen, which she was. He is correctly called the father of modern drama, in a good sense of modern drama, for several reasons, one of which I'm going to touch on in the end this morning. But just to orient you at the outset, he is an exponent of the well-made play. He is a romanticist who avidly read, guess who? Corneille, Racine, Shakespeare, Byron, and Hugo before he was 20 obviously did not have an American education. <laughs> and he is an extremist in what I personally identify with and regard as a very good sense. He has been wildly praised and criticized in his, since he started writing. And as one commentator put it, he has had a sad fate because he is, quote, too radical for the 19th century and too conservative for the 20th. Unquote. In other words, that's a very hopeful <laughs> from our point of view. Now, a, a word on the historical context. We're in the late 19th century now. This is a hundred years after our last play, after Schiller. Uh, at the time of Schiller, political freedom was just erupting in the sense of the American and French revolutions. And of course, technological progress via the Industrial Revolution and capitalism then took over. And that was accompanied by a full-fledged romantic development in art, where artists uh, were concerned with self-made heroes. There was widespread intoxication with freedom, both in the sense of the idea of free will and man's self-determination, and in the sense of political freedom, the untrammeled freedom to do with your life what you decided people held the idea that under these fantastic conditions we could never go anywhere but get better and better. And they came to believe, as the 19th century did, simply from the observation that every day and every way things get better and better, to borrow the formulation from Kuwait, they came to the idea that progress is self-evident and automatic, an idea of which the 20th century would have disabused them entirely. But uh, the idea was all change will be a gradual change toward improvement. And thus evolution became the byword of the period. Evolution did not become the byword because of Darwin. Darwin became the byword because of evolution. He's the one that took the idea in the atmosphere of evolution and gave it a scientific base within the field of biology but it had been essential to Hegel's philosophy before Darwin. It was in the atmosphere everywhere. And uh, as you'll see, there, I cannot think of a thinker influenced by the 19th century seriously who was not an evolutionist in one way or another. Uh, even the religious people thought that we evolved in understanding God's word, and Ibsen also comes out for evolution. So when you read 19th century, 
you pretty much have to discount evolution as a theory of what they believe because everybody believes it is like motherhood. Now, Ibsen has to be understood in this context, not that he's at all difficult to understand, but his, the overall message of his total body of work is that man is free, but he doesn't use his freedom intelligently. We need the freedom to break with the past, to start over, to throw off the establishment, to think things through afresh and from the beginning. And who does he therefore remind you very much of in the 17th century, the early modern period? It's the same program as Bacon, Francis Bacon, and Descartes held. Sweep everything aside and start over from the beginning. And that's always a hopeful note if that's somebody's viewpoint because they're throwing out all the prejudices and errors and trying to start over rationally. Ibsen is therefore a thorough iconoclast, an idol smasher, but that does not make him a nihilist or a skeptic. A skeptic would say that freedom is impossible, for instance, because man isn't good enough for it, which is what they all say today. Or freedom is a threat because we don't know how to use it, which the existentialists in the 50s used to say. Ibsen believes man's mind is capable of governing him and directing his actions, but that man is not using the powers he has, that all of his institutions are warped and corrupted and have to be reconstructed from scratch. So he comes across as attacking everything, marriage, morals, and quote, even liberalism and reform, to say nothing of conservatism and reaction. Uh, and since everything is pretty rotten, you can almost always sympathize with him. An eloquent touch uh, capturing his perspective, the very final words he uttered on his deathbed were, he was in conversation with someone and the, his very last three words were, on the contrary. <laughs> You're going to die. It's very important that you figure out what your last words are going to be. <clears throat> and then stop after you've said them. <laughs> now, the plot of Enemy of the People was based on an incident which Ibsen had heard about. <clears throat> In the 1830s, a German doctor warned the people at a spa that an outbreak of cholera had occurred there. The season at the resort was ruined, and the townsfolk stoned the doctor's house, and he had to flee. And that was the germ of the idea for this play. There was also a case in Norway of a chemist who had denounced the Oslo steam kitchens for neglect of the poor. And when the chemist attempted to read a prepared speech repeating his earlier attack, attack the chairman tried to prevent him from speaking, and the audience forced him to withdraw. And this is very similar to what happens to Dr. Stockman in the fourth act of the play. So here again, even though it's 19th century, he's taking his main plot situation from events that he heard, but transforming it into a profound piece by his genius. Let's go now to number two, the plot theme. Now I'm going to give you an example of what a nominalist would say about the plot theme. A nominalist is someone who on principle rejects essences and abstractions, who can do nothing but recite concretes, and that is the great majority of critics and literary commentators through the ages. Now you may have heard of Carl Van Doren. I believe that that's the same one that was tainted in the quiz show scandals uh, 40 years ago, or whatever, what, 35 years ago. Well, he's also a commentator, and this is his brilliant statement of the essence, the essence, mind you, of Enemy of the People. Quote, this play is the story of a man who learns that the water of the municipal baths in a town in Norway is infected, supposes that the authorities will at once move to do away with the public menace, finds that because of the necessary expense they refuse to pay any attention to him, tries single-handed to correct the abuse, is defeated and mobbed and has to take refuge. And that, it goes on and on like that. 
And then he comes to what does it mean? Now, of course, for a nominalist, what does all that mean? It doesn't mean anything, whatever, because it's just a string of concretes. So he says, the misfortunes of the play are too highly individualized to be looked upon as allegorical, symbolical, or even typical. Now, armed with that wonderful overview, the student is supposed to go in and read this play. And, uh, in other words, there's no wider meaning, no theme, no message, no significance. I, I thought I would give you that as a horror example as to why by, you've got to grasp the essence, which is the plot theme. Otherwise, you have nothing except a recapitulation of what happens in the play with no insight into it. Now, the plot theme functions, I think, as I've said, to a play the way a definition does to a concept. Did I tell you that? In essence, it gives you the essence of the play condensed in a way that contrasts it with other plays and relates it to those plays which are closest to it. Just the way in which a definition, you'd get a genus which tells you the category which is similar, the most similar to the thing being defined, and then a differential, what sets it apart. So with the plot theme, uh, you have to give it in such a way that you bring it in conjunction with the plays that it's closest to, and then say what sets it apart. So what I think we should do is define the plot theme in this case in relation to Antigone. Because in both they have, let us say, the genus in common, I'm using genus here metaphorically, of the individual directly challenging and disobeying authority. So they are basically the same kind of play. And the best way to capture uh, an enemy of the people is simply to differentiate uh, uh, differentiated from Antigone. And here are some of the key differences, which, none of which change the fact that it's basically the same situation as uh, Antigone. <clears throat> but here's one difference. Uh, Antigone challenges the authorities over a moral issue directly the refusal to give her brother proper burial. Thomas Stockman confronts them first over the issue of factual truth. Are the baths poisoned? And only as the conflict deepens does it become a moral issue. And of course, it is not the same issue, same moral issue as in Antigone. The moral issue in this play is to accept the truth or not to accept the truth at any price, or to evade, fudge, and compromise it for the sake of higher concerns. So in this play, the conflict is first over the content of truth, then over the value of truth, and only then over freedom, the freedom necessary to pursue the truth. So that's one difference in content of the challenge. Now, there's also a more modern element to the challenge beyond the issue of the content. Thomas Stockman is a scientist, a modern experimental scientist. He is not an ancient princess. Now, Antigone is a moralist who had no objective proof of her morality, of what the gods really expect us to do with the corpses of the dead. But Stockman, Thomas, I always have to say Thomas because he's got his wicked brother. Thomas Stockman, the scientist, has objective experimental proof of what he stands for. And so his mission takes on the meaning of the man of reason as against the passion of the mob. So from the very nature of his uh, clash, you can already see emerging Ibsen the secularist, in contrast to Sophocles, the, religious, the religionist. Ibsen the secularist and even atheist, which he was. Now, so this is a completely this worldly play. By the 19th century, God has dropped out altogether. <clears throat> now he comes back 
in Shaw and in other forms, but he never comes back the same way that he was uh, in the past. Now another difference with Antigone, another and a more modern slant to this play, is the nature of the authority being rebelled against. Antigone defies the corrupt ruler in a monarchy. Thomas Stockman takes on the entire society in a democracy. Now, what does society fight him over? It's a really modern society here. For instance, it's to be contrasted with what society fought Socrates over. Society fought Socrates in the ancient world because of his religious convictions and because of their religious convictions such as they were. Socrates, they, they thought, was impious. He worshipped false gods. He corrupted the young, etc. There's no such ideology on the part of society in this play. On the surface, the fight is over money because the people keep talking about the fact that cleaning up the baths is a two-year shutdown. Vast sums of money will be lost. It'll mean economic ruin. But money is not really the issue. Two seconds thought would convince any of them or you that in the long run they're going to be doomed financially anyway. Because when the tourists come and start to die in drove, obviously the word is going to get out. So if money were really the issue and they wanted to be dishonest, the most these people would do is rush to clean up the premises on the sly so no one would ever know. Their dishonesty would never get farther if they were motivated by money than hiding the truth while they busy tried to get rid of the poison. But the point, of course, of Ibsen is that these are short-range mentalities. They are non-planners, non-copers, non-thinkers. They simply don't want to face the problem. They want it to go away. They want to evade. So we have got nothing on their side but numbers. Their attitude is we're the majority, and that decides the issue. If we want it to be that way, that's the way it's going to be. In other words, this is a modern society. It is not a society that has religious convictions, however false, and persecutes a martyr who disagrees. It's a society of short-range relativists, compromisers, and evaders. And this is another reason why he's the father of modern drama, because he captured this type of society with great skill. All right, I think with those contrasts, we can just dictate the plot theme without batting an eye here. It's very simple and straightforward plot theme. An idealistic scientist champions truth against a society of compromisers. That seems to me perfectly straightforward. And the very nature of that situation, if you're sick of the quality of the contemporary world, is calculated to make you lick your chops in anticipation. <clears throat> Unless, of course, they're going to defeat him. The plot theme doesn't tell us what happens, just the nature of the conflict. What then is the essential conflict that we read off from the plot theme? How about if somebody volunteers now by raising your hand? The essential conflict between A and B. I'll give you the first half of it. Thomas Stockman versus society. Yes, Thomas Stockman versus society is the conflict in this play. And appropriately, the two come face to face at a certain point. But throughout the play, society has to be represented by various characters 
so that in concrete terms the conflict is Thomas Stockman uh, versus his brother Peter the mayor. Thomas Stockman versus Aslaxon the printer. Thomas Stockson versus Hofstadt the editor. Thomas Stockson versus Kiel his father-in-law. And then all the other conflicts that this central one entails. All the conflicts within the establishment like the editor versus the mayor, or the editor versus the publisher, or Keel versus the mayor, and all the conflict between Thomas Stockman's allies and the establishment figures. For example, Horster, the sea captain, versus the ship owner who fires him. Petra versus the editor. Petra versus her employers who fire her, etc. And here again, the message I'm trying to hammer home, as in any great play, there is a central ruling conflict and then an array, an abundance of derivative clashes. All of it therefore making for passionate, suspenseful, exciting, dramatic play. When the establishment is split, we have the drama of each of them being at each other's throats. And when the establishment coalesces and unites, then we have the virulent ferocity of the mob against Thomas Stockton. So either way, there's something riveting uh, going on. Number three, plot development. And uh, absolutely logical, as all great plays are. Inevitable, and even better than that. First, the establishment of the situation. And that is Acts 1 and 2. In Act 1, we learn that uh, Dr. Stockman, if I just call, let's make the rule that if I just call him Stockman, I mean the hero. If I mean the bad one, I'll say his name. I'll say it's Peter. Stockman is happy, sociable. He expects praise for having discovered the poison. Act 2, he seems to acquire allies but the mayor, surprisingly, surprisingly to him, declares war, and Stockman is indignant and amazed. At this point, the situation is established. There's going to be a fight, and that's the first time by the end of Act Two that we have a situation. The rise to the climax, that's Acts Three and Four. <clears throat> and now we watch as Stockman is step by step stripped of all illusions of support from different factions within the community until there is nothing left for him but to appeal one-on-one -on -one against the whole society. And I hope you see the necessity of his defeat and disillusionment at first in the development of the play. He can't fight for fundamental social change as long as he naively misunderstands the essence of his society, as long as he doesn't realize how deep the corruption goes. It takes him through Act Two uh, to reach this point. And then he has to see at the editor's office his allies collapse. The mayor convert the liberals. Society become a unified front. And at that point, Enraged, he has no option but to confront, as the last court of appeal, the assembled mob. In other words, the conflict is introduced in Act Two and broadened until it reaches the maximum conceivable intensity and scope in uh, Act Four, which is the climax. The high point of the conflict and the point from which the ending has to directly follow. And as I've said several times, uh, by calling something a climax, we don't mean that you can necessarily predict the ending as soon as you read it. But it should at least be that when you reach the ending, you should be able to see in hindsight that it followed inevitably from this climax. So it's often the case that the climax is identifiable only retrospectively. And the essence of the climax here is Thomas Stockman, silenced about the baths, tells the moral truth about the society to their faces. 
He denounces the authorities and the public, the compact majority as he calls it, and he receives the final sentence from the uh, Supreme Court of Democracy, the mob. He is, they claim, an enemy of the people. So it's again, he's the lead character, you see, and that's his ironic title in the play. And of course, the people then, with great logic, turn ugly when he tells them what he thinks of them and take out after him. And that leads us to the third and last part of the play, the resolution, which is Act 5. Now here again, as with the great playwright, the resolution doesn't just meander to a close. And that's it. It itself has tremendous suspense and structure. Um, uh, Stockman's attack on the authorities has escalated, as we saw in the climax, to an attack on the whole society and all the citizens. So logically now he has to end up how? He has to end up alone, alone with a few allies. And in the situation, in the resolution, the situation is brilliantly uh, milked. Every kind of temptation is dangled before him, one after the other. The mayor offers him his job back, if only he'll recant. Keel offers to make his family rich, and it turns out that if he doesn't give in, his family is going to be paupered. The editor offers him all the support and publicity he'll ever want. They are all, it's like they take him up to the top of the building and they show him all the world will be his if only he will recant. And he is adamant. Notice he doesn't bat an eye at the fact that he's condemning his children to starvation and poverty. Too bad for them is his attitude. He has nothing but scorn for all of the people that did not dare do otherwise. He keeps using that phrase, yes, they didn't dare do otherwise in the face of public opinion. The school that dismisses his daughter, the landlord that cancels his lease, the ship owner that fires his friend, the captain. And at one point, he expresses his estimate of these people in a very graphic and visual way. And remember, this is meant to be seen on stage by knocking these swine out of his house with an umbrella. At one point, we see him thinking of escaping to the far west. Now, the far west does not mean the far west of Norway, which would be very wet. It means the United States, where he could live on the frontier. And there still was a frontier. This is before California was settled by the Republicans and um, live in solitude. But he changes his mind about that because he's not going to concede his hometown to the enemy. And so his inevitable decision is to stay alone and start over. So he's starting over at the end of the play and going to build the right society just exactly in the way that Ibsen thought his whole life mission was to start over and build the right society. Now we have to answer this question. Is the fact that Stockman ends up alone with his few supporters and family starting over, is this failure or success for him? Is this a happy ending or a tragic ending? It's a happy ending. He's a success because he's happy. And he's happy, why? Because he's discovered that he is, he, well, he always knew he was right. But now he's discovered that the right man is the metaphysically efficacious man. The man with the power to cope with reality and achieve his goals. And that's what he calls the strong man. Or what Ibsen other, where other places calls the creative selfish individual. So he has the power to start life anew. So there's no doubt that Ibsen regarded this as a happy ending. Now, 
we were always concerned with the logic of the ending. Does a play have to have the kind of end that it does? If it's a good play, yes, it does. It's not just the caprice of the author. It's not at all his caprice. Why does this play end happily? Why must it? Why couldn't we have had the same situation but it end up the way Socrates did in real life? He has to drink hemlock. Or why couldn't it end up with Thomas Stockman being alone, hated, crushed, and a suicide? Now, it would be the same situation, the same development, but the ending would have taken a dramatic, malevolent turn. Now, there's two main reasons why it could not have ended up this way. And I stress to you, an author's creative freedom does not give him the freedom to have whatever ending he wants. If he has a logical situation and characters drawn a certain way, the ending has to write itself. If he wants a certain ending, then he's got to start with that ending and rewrite or rather write the entire play to bring him to that ending. But the idea that people have of, well, you could have changed this, any play in to make it happy or make it sad, is fantastic. It means whoever thinks that has no idea that a play is like a work of geometry. And once the axioms are laid down, the, theory is, the theorem is inevitable. The skill of the playwright is to do the inevitable while letting you think, oh my God, I never expected it. But it's got to be I never expected it, but I see it couldn't have been otherwise. This is what the same thing a great murder mystery has to be. It startles you, and then you say, yes, it had to be this suspect. So ending is something to be explained, not wished away. And as I say, there's two main reasons in this play why it simply has to have a happy ending. One comes from the theme, which we'll discuss later, but I think you can easily see that whatever travails he goes through, Stockman is never really threatened. He's so independent that they can't hurt him. He creates his own well-being, his own success, his own projects, his own happiness, and therefore he is so impervious that whatever they do to him, they obviously can't crush him. So the theme demands that ending. It would be analogous to uh, the Fountainhead being as it was, but at the very end, Rourke says, I just can't take Keating anymore and commit suicide. I mean, <laughs> it would be fantastic. It would destroy the entire book because of the utter illogic of it. <clears throat> now, another derivative or secondary reason, not derivative because it's independent, but it's another reason why it would be particularly ludicrous for this play not to have a happy ending because this play by genre, are you ready for this, is a comedy. Yes. This is not a tragic comedy either. <clears throat> it's a real comedy. In other words, Ibsen intends to evoke laughter all the way through, which Corneille did not. There's plenty of humor and satire in here. And there's even slapstick and clowning around involving the hero himself when he tries on the mayor's hat and when he beats these people down with an umbrella. And there's a crazy drunkard that is put in there to evoke laughs. <clears throat> so there's lots of fun and jokes and laughter and at the same time a heroic character with a serious struggle and a happy ending now this is a new phenomenon in drama this combination of laughter all the way through seriousness and heroism all the way through and a happy ending there was no name for it when Ibsen wrote it and Ibsen himself wrote his publisher the following, quote, I am still uncertain as to whether I should call it a comedy or a straight drama. It has many of the traits of comedy, but it also is based on a serious idea, unquote. And absolutely true, absolutely true. And you see, qua comedy, it has to have a happy ending. <clears throat> and one commentator makes this clever phrase, he says, as one would expect, this is Ibsen's most militant play, a comedy. So, 
Now, in regard to the ending, which we usually do discuss when we get to the resolution of a play, it's similar in many ways, but also different to the ending of The Fountainhead, and I just want to point that out. This, the whole play and The Fountainhead are very similar, or I guess I should put it the other way. The Fountainhead is very similar to Enemy of the People in its theme, uh, essential characters, development, etc. <clears throat> so it's hardly an accident that Ms. Rand admired Ibsen. But I want you just now to observe there's a certain similarity and difference to the ending of The Fountainhead. Both Stockman and Rourke are individuals who successfully defy society. But Rourke wins in the present. He sees the reality of his ideal in this world in his lifetime as against in future generations. Now Stockman, on the other hand, would be more like if the fountain had ended with Rourke having his blueprints for the ideal building ready, and a class of young architectural students taking notes, and the idea that someday someone would hire them and they will build accordingly. So another way to put it would be Thomas Stockman ends up the way I did, not the way Rourke did. In other words, he has his theory, he has his hope, he's undefeated, but the full reality of the change that he wants in the world will take place well after he dies. Uh, now, there is something to be said about this kind of deferred benevolence. Uh, a really benevolent person would be somewhat, somewhat, slightly bothered by this. And I'll tell you this, I, I one night told my daughter, Kira, the story of this play, because she always wants a bedtime story, and I figured this was, you know, the kind that she, she's eight. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, uh, uh, after I saw how well it went over with her, the teacher had been asked me once a year to go to, go to her school and lecture on philosophy, just to, to a grade two class. The preceding year, I did Plato and Aristotle for them in grade one. But this year, I decided to do An Enemy of the People, because it went over so well with Kira. And uh, the teacher said that they would be able to concentrate for maybe 10 minutes. And it turns out they sat for 40 minutes absolutely motionless. And they were so enchanted with the play that they demanded by you know, popular sentiment that the class stage the play <laughs> using the original text, the adult text. So she found an excerpted version that was basically Acts 4 and 5, but with enough exposition put in so you could follow it. And that class put on the, the whole thing with props and uh, scenery, etc. And the principal and the other teacher says it's inconceivable that a grade 2 class is going to be able to perform Ibsen. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. <clears throat> In any event, I was, I was telling you this just on the side of the fact that when I first told her the story, uh, and then I told her just as it happened about the baths and the poison and the fight, etc., and then that he was going to start over, and she, I said, well, that's it, time for bed. And she looked at me, and she said, was that all? And I said, well, what, what else did you want? She said, well, what happened when they came to the baths? In other words, she was caught up in the existential story, and she was not prepared to drop it and hear that in the next generation she wanted the end of the story. So I, you know, I had to tell her, well, the people came. I said, Ibsen didn't really discuss this, but the idea is that people came, and they dropped like flies, and then the word got around, and the mayor got kicked out, and I had to make up a whole after story. <laughs> And then she was happy to go to bed. <laughs> but what is significant is that the actual existential concrete which provoked the issue is dropped by Ibsen when the higher moral issues are reached. He, in effect, defers the plot line to future generations. And that understandably bothered her. Now, an Ayn Rand novel, by contrast, always answers the concrete question of the story. 
It doesn't just jump off to, well, things will be resolved in the future. In that sense, I think her novels are more benevolent. They have a more perfect integration of mind and body than in, than in this play. They don't defer the reality of their theoretical resolution to another era. Even Atlas Shrugged, which she originally conceived as going along three generations, because when she first thought of it, she never thought she could make it plausible that it would happen in one generation, but even that she couldn't live with. And so she ended it with, we're going back to the world now, is the idea, you see. Uh, we've won and the world is ours today, as against it's my son's or my grandson. All right, let us go now to number four, characters. Which uh, characters are essential? Obviously, Thomas Stockman. But several others are essential also, because society is too broad a generality. It needs to be personified. Now, there have been playwrights who are prepared to have society represented on stage by an undifferentiated mob. I think of Gerhard Hauptmann, the uh, German playwright in the 20th century, late 19th, 20th century, um, whose idea of the proletariat was just a mass of workers thrown on and you couldn't tell one from the other and none of them had a bigger part than any other. Now, Ibsen is a thorough individualist. So even the dramatization of the collective, he wants some strong, eloquent individual to speak for. And thus, the mayor, Peter Stockman, his brother. Now, the fact of them being brothers is only to heighten the contrast, to say, in effect, you see, they had the same upbringing, but look how op opposite they are. It is not a hidden code. <clears throat> now, Peter is the minimal antagonist, but if it were only him, it would be a pretty thin play because we'd have to make real that the mayor does speak for everybody. And if the rest of the society never appears on stage, we would end up, in effect, with a two-character conflict. It would be Thomas versus Peter, like Antigone versus Creon, you see. And since it's of the essence that the enemy here is the mob, the group, the majority, it's very logical that he has to give, uh, he, uh, Ibsen, has to give society other voices of its own. You want to see representatives of different classes, different political parties, so that what emerges is the sense of the whole society. And the main groups that Ibsen selected were basically three. The liberals, who are allegedly revolutionaries. They're Marxists. They want true socialism. They fight for the workers. They are, in effect, the left intellectuals and labor and they're symbolized by the editor. Then there's the petty bourgeois, the small businessmen class, and they are presented as what they are, middle of the roaders, trying to appease everybody, as Loxon the printer is the spokesman for them. And then there is the aristocratic establishment, the rich, which is deliberately drawn by Ibsen with two branches. One of them is now outdated, but it was not in the 19th century. The two branches of the aristocracy are the mayor, which is just the old aristocracy in a modernized uh, version, and the other branch is Kiel. He represents the feudal mentality, the pre-modern mentality the traditional aristocracy before the Industrial Revolution, the pre-scientific pre aristocracy. We don't have that anymore except among Hollywood movie stars. In other words, he doesn't even believe in science. He thinks the whole thing is a joke by Thomas Stockman. It's just a sheer intrigue. Now, that is a, it's an attempt to grasp a, a segment of society that has now perished, thankfully. So he is the most dated of the characters. But you should try and do that. If, if it's a great playwright, he does not just multiply characters at random. So you should try to figure out what is he getting at by this character? What is the point of including this? Why every character has to earn its inclusion in the play? 
Not just because it's intrinsically interesting, but because it's an essential in some form to the action or the meaning of the action. And the more you see that, for instance, it's a fascinating exercise to go through St. Joan, which has a very large cast, and show exactly what he has in mind by every sub-character. And he does have something in mind. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time tomorrow to go over them all. But if you read commentaries, you'll see that none of those are thrown in at random. And that's true of any great play. You can take anybody and show why this was put in. Now, I don't maintain that every one of these lesser characters in Enemy of the People, for instance, are absolutely indispensable. It de depends on what the complexity of the play will carry, how long it takes to develop these characters, etc., and so on. And you could even legitimately say how much would scenery and costumes, etc., cost if it's a small company he's writing for. But at minimum, I think we could agree with the fact that the mayor has to be there as the outspoken, uh, outspoken representative of the establishment, and the editor has to be there as the uh, spokesman of the liberal intellectual. We have to see the fight within society, and then the fact that their fight is meaningless in compared to where they agree as against the true uh, individual. So um, that much, those two at least are essential. Now, in looking at the characters, there's another group of characters, a smaller part, but also essential to the play, and that is Thomas Stockman's allies and friends. And that means basically his wife and children and Captain Horster. Now, why are these characters necessary? <clears throat> well, there's several reasons. One, they heighten suspense because they raise the stakes of the conflict. <clears throat> they help dramatize in action all the consequences that are going to flow from Stockman's challenge to society. They make you care even more because you see what's going to happen to his friends and associates as a result. It's also very important, I think, for purposes of objectivity. That is to say, if you are going to show a man standing against everyone, 100%, there is always going to be an unspoken implication, however perfectly you present him, that there's something eccentric about him. He is a weirdo. And therefore, what you want is to take some perfectly ordinary, obviously healthy, decent people, however small their role, and show that they admire and are friendly with him. And that takes away the curse of being some kind of psychotic or, or uh, uh, weirdo. So, for instance, Mike in the Fountainhead serves that purpose. The very fact that Mike the, you know, the blue-collar worker is friendly with Rourke, automatically gives Rourke an objectivity that he is a real human being, that a decent, uneducated man would enjoy being friendly with. <clears throat> and the same is true of his mania in regard to Antigone. If you saw only Antigone, but without her sister or her lover, you, the question would be raised, is she high-strung, is she... You see what I mean? And in this case, uh, going on with uh, Ibsen, there's still a third reason for these uh, you know, intimates and friends of Stockman. Ibsen wants to pave the ground for a happy ending. He wants to leave Thomas Stockman a future. And if he's utterly alone, he simply can't build that future. He needs a younger generation that's sympathetic to his ideas that he can then shape and mold. And you see how well integrated this play is. As early as Act One, before we know anything about what's going to happen, Petra, the daughter, announces the need for a school of her own where the children aren't taught lies. 
That idea is planted as just part of the character development. But that's what you call a great playwright. A minor line turns out to be the whole thing that you need, only you don't know it at the time. That's what you call a well-made play. Uh, I think it was Miss Rand was quoting Chekhov once that said, you can tell the difference between a good play and a bad play by the fact that in a good play, if there's a gun on the mantelpiece in Act 1, it goes off in Act 3. <coughs> there's nothing that isn't cashed in on. Now, Petra and Horster represent the new younger generation. Horster, the sea captain, Ibsen insists in his stage notes for the play has to be a young man. The two have to become strongly attracted to one another, and then there is the promise of a happy resolution. I think we will uh, take our six-minute break here and then look at the character of Thomas and his brother Peter in more detail. All right, I want to pick up now with Thomas Stockman. He has been likened by commentators both to Socrates and to Jesus. And in the sense that he is a rebel against the world, there are some similarities. <clears throat> but he is a unique character in several ways. He is not a loner. He is not a grim ascetic. He's certainly not an otherworldly type. He's not even a man who knows and expects his fate the way Antigone knew what was coming. Uh, Socrates expected a clash on philosophic grounds. He knew the world around him. Jesus was omniscient. <laughs> Antigone knew what to expect of Creon, but Thomas Stockman simply didn't expect any trouble. He is presented as a unique kind of rebel. He's warm, gregarious, patriotic, amiable, convivial, fun-loving, people-loving. There's nothing within him prompting him to rebel or preparing him for the role of rebel. On the contrary, he has a lot of friends, he loves them, he's a happy man, but as he discovers, you have to choose and truth is even dearer to him than his friends. He never expected the conflict, but when it comes to his naive astonishment, he's astounded. But nevertheless, he comes down on the side of truth. So in a way, Ibsen dramatizes his de uh, Stockman's devotion to truth even more fully by this kind of characterization of his protagonist. <clears throat> now, like Socrates and Jesus, Stockman too stands to la lose all worldly assets by his stand. He's going to lose money, he'll be fired. He's going to lose his reputation, he's going to be the enemy of the people. He's going to lose his friends and any power or influence that he had. His, he and his family will be completely abandoned. But unlike Socrates and Jesus, he is not completely indifferent to this. He is not indifferent to love, fame, money, influence. Uh, Ibsen makes a point that he cherishes esteem. He loves having his articles praised. He enjoys his money, spending it, and the luxuries that it'll bring him. He does want to influence and change the world. He doesn't take the attitude of, he doesn't care, he's above what goes on. He is a thoroughly worldly rebel, a very uncommon phenomenon. And at the outset, he expects to earn and deserve all these good things, uh, money and love and influence, etc. He expects to earn them in his life by his own judgment and effort. Then gradually he sees what he is up against. He still wants worldly success, but first he sees he has to fight. So Thomas Stockman is a first-hander, a self-starter, a self-mover. He has a fighting spirit, a love of truth, he's highly intelligent, and he has an ebullient, optimistic outlook about man and the future from first to last. He's guiltless, tenacious, uncompromising, no conflicts within himself. 
no doubts, no self-doubts. He is certain. So he's the essence of strength. Now, I stress this fact that he's not a pining idealist alienated from society. He feels he's really enjoying himself. It's a splendid time to live. There's great things to work and fight for. And here is Ibsen's description of him, of Thomas Stockman. Now listen to this one, because this quote has caused more trouble in interpreting the play. Quote, I have enjoyed writing, this is Ibsen to his publisher, I have enjoyed writing this play. Dr. Stockman and I got on so very well together, we agree on so many subjects. But the doctor, this is the key, bad, or confusing sentence, but the doctor is a more muddle-headed person than I am. And because of this and other peculiarities of his, people will stand hearing a good many things from him which they perhaps would not have taken in good part if they had been said by me. Unquote. Now this has been the standard line of critics ever since. The consensus is that the flaws of Thomas Stockman are what makes the play palatable. And uh, here's from one such critic. The fact that Dr. Stockman is portrayed as a comedy character part, muddle-headed as Ibsen himself says, takes the curse off his violent attacks on the mobs and the masses. People are willing to accept such things from a man at whose personal foibles and eccentricities they are invited to laugh. Unquote. And here's from Harold Clerman in his book on Ibsen. He says in this play, quote, the little man grows big, but as Ibsen Stockman, he remains little and lovable. A gravely thundering or heroic Stockman would provoke personal and intellectual skepticism. But we can embrace the Stockman who replies to the mayor's question, are you a raving lunatic with the answer, yes, I am. Unquote. Now I regard these examples, which I could multiply at will, dis as disgusting examples of value hatred. But let's just explore for a moment what is the truth about Stockman in this respect? What are his alleged flaws? What explains Ibsen's remark about him being muddle-headed? Now, there's a lot of factors, but to condense to just a few, because it all follows the same pattern. Well, one thing often invoked here is Stockman's naivete, his very inability to predict that this kind of crisis is going to develop. But I simply say that that is pure benevolent universe. The innocence of a scientist wrapped up in his work who has nothing but goodwill uh, toward others. Well, then there's also his so-called clowning. You know, running around with an umbrella, chasing these people and trying on the mayor's hat and dancing around. I think it's obvious that this is overflowing good spirits. This is not self-derogation. Now, I will concede one thing only. Th Thomas Stockman does not have, let us call it the heroic resonance that Antigone or Lacide, or St. Joan does. But I think that's simply because it is a comedy. It's not because he is a flawed character within that comedy. He's also been criticized by the fact that he seeks and needs praise when he writes a paper. But I think that's fantastic as criticism. Because anybody who writes something good wants other people to enjoy it. The question is, do you earn the praise that you want or not? And it happens to be the case that Ibsen coveted medals from foreign governments, which he thoroughly earned. So Stockman is like Ibsen in that respect. I do not regard that as a weakness. Now, of course, there's the fact that he is an intemperate extremist which all the critics uh, write down as his basic weakness. But of course, I think that's the essence of his virtue, and so does Ibsen. 
Ibsen in that way is exactly like Dominique, or, or vice versa. Uh, and in his play Brand, he has the character say, all or nothing. He does not believe in the middle of the road or the golden mean or moderation. To Ibsen, that is anathema. And I find that tremendously refreshing. Now, as far as this muddle-headed term, term goes, you have to remember that Ibsen applied the comment to himself as well as to as Dr. Stockman. I don't take it as a serious comment by Ibsen. It's a tongue-in-cheek, it's a playful comment. And I think it's more about Ibsen than about the character. Its meaning really is, in effect, Thomas Stockman is even more innocent and hopeful, less corrupted by the world. So it's like an admiring remark with an edge of sardonic wit. Now, it's very rare to have an unbreached hero who evokes laughter. But nevertheless, I think that's what you have here. And the message is not that he has feet of clay, because the laughter has to be with him not at him. It has to be the laughter of delight, not of a ridicule. And of course, the modern critics can't conceive of such a thing. Uh, their idea of laughter is Ellsworth Toohey's, to tear down. All right, now let's turn to Peter Stockman. <clears throat> now, he is allegedly motivated by money, power, social standing. And these are the conventional values. But the point is that he wants all these things out of context, short range, regardless of justice, just because he wants them. So he is primarily a whim worshiper. He's uninterested in thought or ideas. Interestingly, he denounces intellectual innovation explicitly. He is the real second-hander. Now, to show you how deep Ibsen is and how well thought out this play is, you can see the deeper contrast between Thomas and Peter, which is presented from every aspect of the play. Look at the overall development of the play. Where does it start? What, what is the first issue? With a material, physical question. Are the baths poison? And it then evolves into the very same issue on the spiritual life level. Is our spiritual life poisoned? Is our spiritual life corrupted by undetectable but real uh, toxins? And one co commentator makes this really beautifully, this point. He says, Stockman begins by detecting the microbes within physical reality, within the baths, that are undetectable by ordinary seeing, and then proceeds to discover the polluted sources of our spiritual life that are undetectable by ordinary thinking. And this movement or development is symbolized by Ibsen in the setting, which shows you how carefully this was thought out. In what room does the play begin? In the dining room with people relishing a good meal. In what room does it end? In the study with people discussing the proper education of the soul. In other words, if you get it, did, did you miss that in reading? How many of you missed that? Oh, you've got to pick up those things. <laughs> if they start in the dining room, they're eating for a reason. And, it will, and a great playwright, it'll probably be a thematic reason, and you'll see the development uh, from there. Nothing is accidental in a great work of art. He doesn't just have them sit down because he couldn't figure how to start and there happened to be a leg of lamb around his house so he figured he's going to start there. Everything is calculated. Remember what I quoted from Ayn Rand in my book on objectivism on the part on aesthetics. In a great work of art, nothing is accidental and that includes the setting. And the Ibsen's point, you'll see how deliberate it is, is that on both levels, material and spiritual, Thomas Stockman is the life-endorsing champion. He relishes material pleasures and intellectual uh, pleasures. He's a champion, in effect, of hot meat and hot ideas. 
And Peter, by contrast, is the enemy on both levels. Notice he has a poor digestion. <laughs> and that's deliberate. He's an ascetic in regard to food, a Puritan, and in the same way we could say he's intellectually a Puritan. He's, he abstains from thought, although he's shrewd and manipulative. It's a deliberate, decisive contrast across the board, a complete integration of mind and body in both characters. And what is interesting is that despite this integration of mind and body, or as, rather as part of it, Peter is portrayed as having a split between theory and practice, which Thomas doesn't have. Peter says, oh yes, my brother has ideas, but I'm the practical one. So in other words, he is a self-admitted unthinker. He doesn't care about truth. He doesn't care about abstract values. What he prides himself on is his ability to connive and manipulate people. And that's the only way he knows to achieve his goal. Now, both of these characters are selfish, just in the way that Keating and Rourke are both selfish in some sense. Peter, in this case, they both have the same name, the bad one. I think that's an accident. Peter, um, Peter Stockman wants to grab the unearned and sacrifice others while protesting that he's doing it for the welfare of mankind. Now, Thomas Stockman on the others talks about the welfare of the people. But when you come down to it, he places his own judgment and his own ideals as supreme and as much more important than the survival of the country as a whole, which he says repeatedly. And Ibsen himself sometimes describes his viewpoint, his own viewpoint, as the defense of creative selfishness. Now observe the choice of names. Did you think Peter and Thomas were accidental? Who is Thomas? Doubting Thomas, the skeptic. And what is Peter? Greek for rock. You know, when you petrify someone, you turn them to rock. So he's the unshakable rock of the community. But, another little touch of genius, observe that these names at a deeper level are easily reversed. Who is the real rock on which mankind depends? The real absolutist, Thomas, the doubter. And who is the real doubter, torn by uncertainty and self-doubt? The rock. Peter. So it's a perfect little contrast. Now, the, we, we don't have time to go into the lesser negative characters, but you should just observe that Ibsen was famous for his capacity to satirize hypocrisy. And this is most obvious in this play in regard to Hofstad, the alleged revolutionary liberal who preaches self-reliance and liberating the masses and then crumbles the moment he encounters real opposition. And even better it's, uh, is Ibsen's famous irony in regard to S. Loxon, the coward whose motto and goal repeatedly is moderation, which Ibsen, to his great credit, hated. And he has this wonderful little point about, Ips, about uh, S. Loxon being timid in regard to the local authorities and outspoken in criticism of the national government, about which he feels free to talk boldly. And he offers the rationalization as Loxon. Well, he doesn't want to say anything about local government because he might be affected by his words and make things still worse. Whereas the national government, no one's going to listen to him anyway, so he can speak. And obviously, the true point that Ibsen is suggesting is that for this character, floating abstractions of defiance are OK, because they don't threaten anybody or provoke any reprisals. Whereas addressing yourself to a concrete reality can provoke reaction and retaliation, and so you should shut up. Now, this is just perfect as an analysis of moderation, and it's a delightfully enjoyable satire. All right, now we're going to have to jump quickly to theme. And the theme of, that's number what, five? And the theme in a word is individualism, not feminism. <laughs> the individual comes above the group. 
He's the source of truth, the discoverer of truth, and the unit of value. And that is to be contrasted, the individual with the mob, the masses, the authorities, the majority. And in places, Ibsen actually says, these are always wrong. The majority is always wrong. And of course, his famous statement of the theme is the last line of the play, or the second last. The strongest man is the man who stands alone. The man who thinks by and for himself, who places his private convictions and conscience above any external authority, including society and its rules. The man who places truth or reality above all other concerns. Now, by contrast, says Ibsen in the play, the majority never has right on its side, only might. Because the majority is stupid. The majority are the fools. The intelligent, the innovators, the revolutionaries are always ahead of the dolts. In the process of history, as Ibsen saw it, is just as the dolts start to catch up, they are still wrong because the innovators have leaped to the next discovery, the next higher truth. So the majority is always supporting old, dying truths. Now, of course, if we're talking, I'm interjecting a comment here, if we're talking about material products, this is OK. The horse and buggy being replaced by the car, by the airplane, by the spaceship, each step being greeted by dismay with the mob. And by the time they accept one, the next one is here. But it doesn't work that way. I'm speaking now on the intellectual level. It's not as though individual rights, A as A, and individualism are evolving the same way material products uh, evolve. A as A doesn't die and get replaced by a newer or better truth, as the advocates of polylogism say. So Ibsen is in a big inconsistency here. He bases, you see, his formal defense of individualism on this idea of the evolution of truth. And yet his defense of individualism commits him to absolutism. So there's a definite problem here. He has to hold his truth as an absolute against the masses. And yet he's committed in this play to evolution as the justification of every truth, and therefore that nothing is really an absolute. And that's too bad that he got sucked into the evolution trap because, in fact, he is a thorough absolutist. He detests compromise and halfway measures. Um, I've already quoted all or nothing from Brand, but let me quote you a bit more from that play. Brand is a religious fanatic, so he is hardly what you call a secular. And to this audience, he would certainly not be a sympathetic character. And don't think that Ibsen is full of characters like this. I had to really work to come up with an Ibsen character that you would, you would admire. But nevertheless, uh, Brand says to a hedonist who is his antipode in the play, enjoy life if you will, but be consistent. Do it all the time. Not one thing one day and another the next. Be wholly what you are, not half and half. Everyone now is a little of everything. A little sin, a little virtue. A little good, a little evil. The one destroys the other, and every man is nothing." Unquote. Excellent speech to give uh, in itself and to give Ibsen's view of the evil of compromise and how most people destroy their own uh, lives and character. Now, you see, unfortunately, by Tying in his ideas to evolutionism, he left himself, Ibsen, open to charges like, the day of individualism is gone. You yourself said truth evolves. Now we're in World War II, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the trouble that in Ibsen is not a philosopher, and therefore he didn't distinguish abstract principles from concretes. So there he was just the child of his age. Hegel and Darwin and the general optimism just sunk him intellectually on this point. Um, now, another formulation of the theme is the minority is always right. 
Now, he's, he is there trying to say that uh, the intellectual vanguard is always moving to the next level of truth which the majority has not yet discovered. He doesn't literally mean that any minority on any question is always right. And uh, there's speculation that the reason, or one of the reasons he included the drunk in the climax, because there was a guy completely alone, but he was the opposite of being strong and right. So it's just like he was trying to acknowledge that not every minority is right. Thematically, what Ibsen opposes is collectivism. And thus he gives this speech to his arch-villain, Peter Stockman. I mean, as an arch-villain in this play, he's hardly a villain in relation to Iago. But Peter Stockman says to Thomas, quote, you have an ingrained tendency to take your own way. The individual ought undoubtedly to acquiesce in subordinating himself to the community or to speak more accurately to the authorities who have the care of the community's welfare, unquote. So for Ibsen, that's the evil. Any subordination of the individual, his rights, his freedom of thought to the group. All right, and now let's look to his broader philosophy. In conclusion, the first thing I want you to note is that Ibsen writes as a moralist, not a cynic, a nihilist, or a pessimist. Individualism for him is an objective moral responsibility. It's a necessity if a man is to develop himself and reach fulfillment. He does not believe everything is subjective, that anything goes, you do whatever you feel like, that collectivism is good for Peter, and individualism is good for Thomas. Absolutely not. He has the, all the conviction of an absolutist with regard to individualism. He is not a cynic. He does not believe virtue is impossible, so let the rats do whatever they feel like. He is an optimist about the future. He believes in heroes with pride, self-esteem, objective strength of character. Now, the fact that he ascribed your strength to a combination of eugenics and culture in this play, we can just conveniently leave aside. He does believe in free will, but he has no clear explanation of how to integrate free will with biology and, and the role of the environment. But there are so many wonderful little touches in his uh, philosophy that come even in this play. He believes strongly you must love your work. Do you remember that little exchange between his two sons? who are astounded that the school doesn't think they're going to, that you should enjoy your work. He believes you're obligated to pass judgment, objective judgment, both in science and in morality. You're obligated to think, to develop, to grow. So in that sense, he's the opposite of a libertarian who says, do whatever you feel. There is no ethics, there is no truth, etc. He is an advocate of selfishness which, of course, would be necessitated by individualism. If you're unselfish, then you have to, of course, sacrifice your most precious, and that means sacrifice your individuality, your own ideas and values for others. And in that broad way, he, he agrees with objectivism, or objectivism agrees with him. And there's a, there's a very interesting quote from Ibsen on his view of selfishness which I am going to take a moment to read here. It's in the context of he got a letter uh, from a friend of his who was complaining that he, the friend, was alone. And Ibsen replied, and I quote, when one stands as you do, and by implication as he himself did, when one stands as you do in so intensely personal a relationship to one's life work, one cannot really expect to keep one's friends. Friends are an expensive luxury, and when one invests one's capital in a calling or mission in this life, one cannot afford to have friends. Now, that's perhaps a hyperbolic statement, but it certainly captures the idea of, is this a man who's socially oriented as a primary? And then Ibsen continues a little later. Oh, no, this is in another letter. Most criticism boils down to a reproach to the writer for being himself. The vital thing is to protect one's essential self, to keep it pure and free from all intrusive elements. 
So you see here his stress on the primacy of self-development, self-fulfillment, self-determination, independence of others. It will have beneficial consequences on others, but that is not the goal. Uh, and of course, if there's to be any clash between your ideas and friends or, and society, you know what direction you have to take. So Ibsen was a real champion of selfishness. He did not have a philosophic definition of selfishness, really. He did not have a system of philosophy of which selfishness was an ingredient. So there were many unanswerable questions as to what did selfishness mean in this situation and that situation. The best I can say is he had a freewheeling but genuine view of selfishness. He had the emphasis on thought, work, and personal fulfillment, but it was so, still too generalized to become a historical moving force. Nevertheless, uh, he did have it uh, very strongly, the idea no group can expect you to put your sacred convictions second. Uh, your convictions have to come before any external consideration, including the interest of the group or of any factions within it. And you get in the enemy of the people line such as, quote, all the incapables must be turned out in every walk of life. We need young and vigorous standard bearers, as against Peter the true altruist, declaring that to Thomas, you're a public servant, and as such, you have no right to a private opinion. I mean, it's just as clear as clear could be. Now, as to Ibsen's politics, since his view of selfishness was largely free-floating, you probably won't be surprised, although you'll be disappointed to learn that he was a self-proclaimed anarchist. But as part of his general iconoclasm, and he uttered statements such as, quote, abolish the concept of the state and you establish the principle of free will. So he was anti-everything. He was anti-capitalist because he took Peter Stockman and the short-range businessmen as an example of that. He was anti-labor. He was anti-socialist. He was anti-communist, although at times it sounded like he was a communist, but not for long. Remember, this is in the 1880s. He was anti-liberals, anti-conservatives, and they said to him, are you for royalty or republicanism? He says, I'm against both. <laughs> he was avowedly against democracy on two grounds. One, he said, intelligence always belongs to the minority. So democracy is doomed by the fact that it elevates stupidity to a ruling position. <laughs> and secondly, he said, it's ridiculous to talk about a right to your, to your opinion. Most people are not entitled to hold opinion. <laughs> now, this is true epistemologically, if not politically. But he's denounced as an elitist or an aristocrat. He is some funny combination of rule by aristocracy plus anarchism, which means he doesn't really, he doesn't really know what he stands for uh, politically. He's against everything. And he couldn't figure out a theory of social relations which really protected and preserved the individual uh, uh, that he advocated. That also diluted his influence and made it possible for the weirdest group of people to come out in favor of Ibsen because he fitted in, it so it seemed, with whatever you, if you hated something in the establishment you could seize Ibsen, he said it's bad too. As far as his deeper philosophy, metaphysics, and epistemology, he had one, and they're in, its, in his plays, but it's just more brief than we're accustomed to from some of the other playwrights in this course. But note, for instance, the man who represents the grasper of truth in this play is not a blind seer. It's a medical doctor, a scientist, using technology, the microscope. So implicitly, it's for reason, the senses, logic, this world, secularism, scientific method. 
Now, Ibsen himself had a later mystical slant in life, but he was essentially a secular and rational philosophy, and an avowed atheist, by the way. Even his mysticism was a kind of freewheeling, non-creedal, not based in any organized religion. Christianity, he says, demoralizes and inhibits both men and women. But on the other hand, in some ways, he respected religion. He would never joke about religion, nor let you make a joke about religion in his presence. To him, religion pertained to sacred values, and he still had enough residual respect for it that he wouldn't laugh at it, even though he didn't believe it. So he's not a systematic philosopher or a thinker. In that sense, for instance, he's completely different from Schiller, who could give you chapter and verse of his views and stick them right in his place. But he does have a broad overall philosophic trend, in contrast, for instance, to Metterling, who doesn't even have views on some of these questions. He has a definite view of science, worldliness, individualism. Now, against this background, you can uh, consider the typical contemporary interpretations of the enemy of the people. You won't be surprised to know that this is a favorite of modern liberals, this play. Arthur Miller came out with a ghastly adaptation of it. And guess what this play has been used uh, to on whose side it's been used. Environmentalists and ecologists, because Ibsen is against pollution and so are they. <laughs> the arms race, Watergate. In other words, any time there's a leftist minority that disagrees with the majority sentiment in the country, they come out and perform Ibsen and they say, you see, that we are the only ones who know the truth, the masses are stupid and ignorant, etc. Now, in a way, Ibsen opens himself up to this because he doesn't always stress the need of objectivity in your self-assertion. He leaves the idea too often of the individual is always right, the majority is always crazy without explaining context and reason. But if you do take the broad picture of Ibsen's plays and Ibsen's philosophy, he would be all for technology over ecology and self-defense over appeasement. So all of this modern ad adoption of Ibsen is, is a bizarre misinterpretation. Now I want to conclude our discussion with Ibsen with one comment, uh, I guess it would come under the general heading of style, just to explain to you briefly why he's been called the father of modern drama. There are many reasons, but this is one. He has heroic characters who are not nobility, aristocracy, or royalty. Now, all the plays to date in this course, the heroes are princess, lords, but here we have commoners. Even Othello has fought, got a royal lineage that we, we find out about. But we have here, we have plain middle-class heroes, workers, scientists, doctors, etc. In other words, it's people who gain their stature exclusively from their character, not from their birth or their title. Now, until the time of Ibsen, these ordinary characters always appeared in farce, in demeaning comedy. They took pratfalls, the laughter was at their expense, they were portrayed as cowardly or like Moliere, miserly or hypochondriacal or whatever. But here, Ibsen extends a dignity and a seriousness, a complexity, to human beings on the basis solely of their character, not their status. And that is his so-called realism. He has middle-class protagonists, the modern man in the modern world, not the heroes of uh, antique legend or the kings of history. Uh, Ibsen started this approach, which we now take for granted in a major way. And observe that at the same time, at the same time that he was able to do this, 
He was not a naturalist. His dialogue is essentialized. It's not as someone observed how people speak, but how they ought to speak. Uh, he is a romanticist in his use of language and in his whole approach to art. Universal themes, heroic characters, exciting, well-made plots, hinging, hinging on the free choices of his characters. And what would be a really good name to use uh, for his aesthetic orientation, since he is a realist, about taking real characters as they live in today's world and presenting them from a romantic, idealized, you could call him a romantic realist. And he knew it, and he has some marvelous lines, which I'll quote to you in conclusion. One contrasting him and Zola, because Ibsen had been called a realist, and he didn't like being called a realist, because they knew that the people took it to mean Zola. So here's a great quote from him. If you know Zola, you'll appreciate this. Zola goes down into the sewer to take a bath, I in order to cleanse it. Which is exactly the difference you see between. And uh, people said to him, well, you mustn't be so moralistic. You just should record the times. And in one of his plays, he gave a perfect answer to that. He said, this is from Love's Comedy. A man must love, excuse me, a man must live in his own time, but he can try to make the times worth living in. Unquote. I'm going to end on that line. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, I'll take some questions. This ran longer than I expected, I must say. You yes. said that his 12 prose plays uh, made up a cycle. Would you discuss that a little bit? I really can't. I don't know the cycle well enough. Uh, I'll tell you only this much about the cycle. The Hegelians, or at least some Hegelians, see the cycle as a development within the dialectic process and have worked out the plays as being related as thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and then that whole three against the next, and they have it all carried out, and it has a kind of a horrific plausibility to it. You know, if you get into that rationalistic world, like the play right after Enemy of the People seems to preach the opposite. That is conformity, and the, the person who stands alone is, is no good. And then there's supposedly a synthesis of it, but I am just not enough of an Ibsen specialist uh, to be able to make an intelligent comment. All I basically have done is I know a few plays that I really like, and I skimmed enough to convince myself in three hours of skimming, that this would be the play for an objectivist audience. Uh, maybe in another year, uh, I'll know a lot more and could answer it. Uh, Gary, is that you? Yeah. yeah. Would you like to retell the story about the little girl at your school who misapplied oh, the theme? That was a really funny story. <clears throat> this is apropos of um, Ibsen's theme. <clears throat> this has actually happened after I gave the uh, lecture on Ibsen to my daughter's class, the teacher phoned us about, I guess, 10 days later, and she said, you know, you really got me into trouble with that Ibsen. And I said, what did you mean? She said, well, about a week after the play, two of the girls got into a fight, not over the play, just over something else. And one of the girls started to really hit and kick the other girl. And we could all see it. So, I sent the girl to the principal, and I went myself along with several of the students who had witnessed what went on, and uh, the principal called us in and asked what happened. We each went around the room, and everybody said what they saw and so on, and then the principal looks at the culprit and says, and what do you have to say for yourself? And this little girl stood up and she said, the majority is not always right. <laughs> <laughs> the teacher apparently was absolutely dumbfounded. <laughs> the principal didn't know what to say and sent them back to the class. <laughs> <laughs>
Now that is a misuse of Ibsen. <laughs> but you see, he leaves himself open to that. It's very important to be exact. But you see how powerful these plays are. The message that can get through, uh, when these kids were asked, uh, and there were seven and eight, they were asked to write a one-page letter to me afterwards, summarizing what they got out of the play in their own words. It was uncanny. There wasn't a one out of 30 kids that didn't state that the thing that struck them is that people aren't always right, so you have to think on your own. At seven, they got this. So if you can just imagine what education, and they got it without pain and without preaching. I myself think if literature were properly taught, you wouldn't have to teach philosophy, you wouldn't have to teach art. You could do such a tremendous job, and the stories are so wonderful. I mean, the, the plots and the characters we already have, they don't even have to be simplified uh, if they're properly taught to a class. The only thing I did to make this story more interesting was to throw in a few perceptual touches, like I told the class, when he tested the water to see whether it was poison, they put it, a litmus paper in it, and if, the if it turned red, it was poison, and if not, it wasn't. And guess what? When they put it in, it turned red. And that was the only kind of detail I made up to make it a little more visual and perceptual for seven and eight-year-olds. But other than that, I just told the straight story, and they ate it up. They were simply enthralled. And uh, one of the things in the question period was, who was going to be the next mayor? <laughs> and they don't have a clear, you know, after Peter Stockman is exposed, they don't have a clear sense, really, of the difference between fiction and reality. And one of them asked me, would I agree to be the next man? <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, I just counsel you, when people tell you that six and seven-year-olds cannot read or appreciate Shakespeare or Ibsen and uh, I, the class now is clamoring to do Antigone. <laughs> so it's just not true. It is just not true that they need Dick and Jane and all this trash that is taught in American schools. You can start them with major classics right off the bat and they eat it up. But you have to know how to teach it. You can't be Carl Van Doren. You, know, you have to be able to <laughs> strip it down to essential. Yes. If I understood you correctly, you said that uh, Ibsen was a conscious advocate of selfishness, yeah. but he was not a philosopher. How is that possible, given the fact that philosophy during the 19th century advocated altruism? Well, it's possible because there is such a thing as being an iconoclast. An iconoclast is somebody who smashes idols, and he had enough of an understanding to realize that what what everybody preached was wrong. You can tell that something is wrong without knowing the truth or even the full answer, how to relate the truth to everything else. You can still tell, an honest man can tell, that if everybody says obey and listen and agree, you have to think on your own. That doesn't mean that he is a philosopher who was able to provide a full definition, a full integrated system. But you can't give mankind, put mankind in so abject a position that only philosophers can think, or only philosophers can have philosophic ideas. That's completely untrue. You can have a philosophic idea if you're intelligent, even a radical one. The problem is it won't go anywhere historically. You won't be able to do very much with it if you don't make it part of a whole system. But, but you mustn't regard it philosophy as somehow exempting a, a man from what it, the otherwise lobotomized state, which is our natural endowment. That is not true. Other questions? Okay, well, fine. I have a couple written ones here. Um, what can we do to guard against making the errors in thinking that the characters opposing Dr. Stockman made? Well, in one word, what objectivist virtue do you have to practice? Which one? Independence. Read the fountainhead. It's the best thing you can do. Because the whole idea of that is how to focus on reality rather than on other people. It's the primacy of existence versus the primacy of people. 
It's looking at reality versus looking at, at others, or as putting it in the deepest terms, it's grasping the metaphysical versus the man-made and realizing that the metaphysical has to be your guide and that you can accept the man-made only if uh, it's based on reality. Now, it's very, it's very significant here that Ibsen himself grasped this point. I do believe he intended to dramatize the distinction between the metaphysical and the man-made as part of the theme here, and that shows you the, the, the penetration of Ibsen's thought. But uh, he goes down to the epistemological root of the distinction between Peter and Thomas, down to the basic relationship between their characters' consciousness and reality. Now, he doesn't know the objective is terminology, of course, but just listen to this, this little exchange. When Peter and Thomas are arguing, and Peter Stockman says, the water supply for the baths is now an established fact and in consequence must be treated as such. Now that to me is a tremendously a fascinating formulation. It's an established fact. What is he doing by calling it that? He's making it a metaphysical reality that you have to bow to, even though it's established only because people refuse to challenge it and accept the real truth. And uh, Peter Stockman says to him, how could you be so stubborn? This is a fact. And Thomas Stockman says, the water's poisoned. Are you mad? It's a lie. And Peter Stockman says, oh, it's all just your imagination. Just join us and don't be an enemy of the community and everything will be well. Now, this is as close as you can come to saying one of these men gave his allegiance to the metaphysical and other to the man-made. And... Uh, the play itself, therefore, gives you the answer of what to do to uh, avoid it. And what's interesting is that each of them looks at the other as though they're mad, as though they're simply insane. Peter Stockman can't grasp why you would raise all this trouble. It's a fact. Why would you go against it? And, of course, Thomas Stockman, being reality-oriented, cannot grasp this is a blatant lie and everyone's going to die. How can you ignore that? And... Uh, uh, this is, this is a, a real feat of uh, character, characterization. It goes to the very core of the two uh, different uh, epistemologies. So um, another thing I may say that Ibsen is celebrated for is the depth of his characterization. And this is certainly a classic example. He, uh, he's going all the way down to the relationship of consciousness to existence. And you, you can't uh, uh, beat that. All right, I still have time for... Any, yes, go ahead. With the, uh, the film industry now, how do you see the long-term prospects for uh, the continuation of stage drama? Say that again. In light of the, uh, the establishment of, of film and movies, how do you see the long-term prospects of oh, stage? Oh, I see what you mean. Do I think the theater will continue as an art form in the light of the movies? Yes. Absolutely. Then I don't see any problem, uh, whatever, with that. Movies can do things that film cannot. It's completely untrue to say that film can do everything that the, the drama can do, but better. That is absolutely untrue because there's a there's a a um, aliveness to drama on stage that no movie uh, will ever capture. The actual reality of a character in front of you that is taking action before your eyes it will never be captured in that same way uh, on film. Uh, also, by the very absence of elaborate sets and camera tricks and so on, you're given the essence. Stage is an essentialized 
medium. In a way, I would say that stage is to movies what sculpture is to paint. It's a highly essentialized, simplified, dramatized version with many fewer attributes. But for that very reason, it has its own charm and emphasis and style. And I happen, now I'm not mandating this as an objective of virtue, I happen to like sculpture better than painting. I would rather see five statues than one that, you know, that I partly like than, than five masterpieces of painting. I don't say that that's obligatory, but I happen to like the stylization of sculpture. A statue catches my eye right away. And the same is true, I would go to a mediocre play over a great movie any day of the week, any day. And it's not that I don't like movies, they just do not give me the, the power, the charge that an evening in the theater does if, if it's half decently done. Uh, I've very rarely seen a movie that I feel is, is a life experience. You know, my life has, has improved for having seen it. There's movies that I enjoy, but they, they don't in me, and I'm giving you this is just a biographical fact, they don't reach the level of feeling this is, a, this, is a, this is an event in life that makes life worth living. But I often feel that in the theater, if it's a great play, uh, even just moderately well uh, produced. So I don't for a moment believe that movies are going to uh, withstand, uh, you know, wipe out plays. On the contrary, in my more pessimistic movement, moment, I think ahead to the future of the dark ages, where there's going to be no more electricity and no more movies. And at that point, when they start over again, there'll be a long, long period where there's going to be plays, because all you have to do is stand up and talk uh, without moving. So if I had to pick which is the most long live of the two, I would definitely vote for the theater. How's that for now? <laughs> Steve, I'll give you the last question. OK. Uh, I have in my notes here that in some way, uh, Dr. Stockman does not have a heroic resonance. Yes, I, like said, I said that. Yeah, and in another way of saying that, isn't it, that he is not a larger-than-life yes. character? Okay. I agree. Now, doesn't that present some kind of a problem, you know, in relation to the others? I'm not sure What's what... What's the problem? I agree with your observation so far, but what is the problem? Thomas, uh, excuse me, Ibsen was not a hero worshiper in the way that the good playwrights that we've so far taken was. One of the things they wanted to do was create total heroes that you could, the best example is Corneille, who got tremendous pleasure out of creating a giant of stature. Now, Ibsen wants to present the, the middle class, the ordinary man, as a fount of strength. But that's not exactly the same as a larger-than-life hero. So in that way, you can make a good distinction between Ibsen and Ayn Rand, because she took the Ibsen technique of taking the middle-class man, but she made him the larger-than-life hero. You see, that you could worship. So she gave the middle-class man the sta stature of the Cornelian hero, which Ibsen himself didn't do. And that's a very interesting uh, uh, question that, that uh, you raised. And it's relevant to the fact that a lot of the uh, women here, several of them have complained that it's the, the question that I asked about which character you would like to sleep with <laughs> is not fair to women because there's, there's many more heroic women for the men to sleep with than vice versa. <laughs> and uh, they universally tell me they don't want to sleep with Dr. Stockman. <laughs> and I can, you know, I can sympathize with that because although he is an unbreached and you know, admirable character, he is not presented as a romantic hero. Uh, he would not be like the Robert Redford type if you cast it in the movies. He'd be a character actor type, you see. And he's, he's happy with his wife in a kind of settled marriage, which is not romantic bliss. 
because it's just simply not presented as that type of zero. Now, is this a flaw in Ibsen? I don't know any law that says you have to present heroes with 100 milligrams of stature rather than 95 or 90. I don't think it's a flaw. You can prefer the other, but I think uh, as far as Ibsen went, he did uh, remarkably. Uh, do you think it's a flaw? Uh, I guess as I'm, I, as I'm thinking, um, it lacks a certain power, but I think that you've just been saying It, it lacks why. a certain power, but on the other hand, it has a delicious humor, mm. and you can't have everything. You know, okay. It's like your eye sees straight ahead very well, but by that very fact, you can't see what's behind you, see? And you can't see the periphery. Everything is limited. You choose a form, you get some virtues, but you have certain delimitations. And if you want, and you treasure, as I do, the excoriating of character like as Watson, then you want a raucous humor as your leitmotif, and then at the same time, you can't have a solemn romantic hero that the women want to go to bed with. It's just, you can't have everything in one place. Okay. Okay, thank you very much.